This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Welcome back to Journal Club, the series where we discuss interesting papers in machine learning and emerging tech. If you're new to my channel, my name is Jordan and I'm a PhD student at MIT who makes content about machine learning, artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, and grad life. And if that sounds interesting to you, definitely consider subscribing. But otherwise, let's get into the paper that we're talking about this week, which is one of several papers that came out a couple weeks ago within the same week on large language models and their potential applications. The paper that we're going to talk about today is called Socratic Models, and I think unlike some of the other papers that came out that week, things like Dolly, things like some of the Facebook and DeepMind models that were released, this is a really interesting approach, an approach that I find really interesting to using large language models in a way that helps us develop models that can create more interesting and hopefully less biased results or help us really interrogate where those biases are coming from and how models come to the decisions that they do. I will note here on my channel, as a general rule, I really try not to personify or anthropomorphize algorithms. I try not to use terms that make them sound like they're people with will that make decisions. But for the purposes of this particular paper, it's a little bit hard not to do that. So just a disclaimer so that you know. So the overall idea behind Socratic models is that large language models, so things like GPT-3, CLIP, are often trained on data sets that minimally overlap in terms of their context. So if you're looking at a model that is trained purely on text, something like GPT-3, versus a model that's trained to translate audio into text or translate video into text like a caption generator. They are performing similar tasks often, but the data sets that they're using are very different, and so there isn't necessarily a ton of overlap in the domain expertise that each model is developing, or the mapping that they're creating between inputs and outputs. And the idea behind Socratic models is to design a set of models that effectively talk to each other in order to facilitate a symbiotic relationship that essentially leverages all of the information that each model generates separately so that we can pull more information from a set of models at a time. I'm going to walk through the paper using the figures, so I will talk about this a little bit more as we get into it, but when it comes to Socratic models in this particular example, we're looking at large language models, so models that map text to text or language to language, as well as video language models, so models that map video to text, and then audio language models, so models that map audio to text. And so as you can see here, actually starting with the first figure, which I think is a really useful visual explanation as to what we're trying to do here, we have essentially three overlapping circles, so large language models that map language to language, visual language models that map language to pixels, and then audio language models that map language to audio. And the common knowledge between these three models is language, so all of them deal with things like caption, things like video description, things like transcribing audio into text. So the commonality that we're working with is text or language, which is what they use to discuss in this paper. And so looking at figure two, ideally we can essentially put these three models together, a visual language model, a large language model, and an audio language model, to have a discussion of sorts where a video language model sees something in a video and receives contextual information from the audio language model, allowing a large language model, for example, to infer something about what is happening in this video or answer a user's questions, which is the main focus of this paper in terms of applications. Speaking of that, there are a few other applications that they go over in this paper that I'm not going to get into the YouTube version of this video, but I will have a full breakdown of this paper over on Nebula, so if you're curious about the other ways that they used the Socratic model method towards applying it to other things, then definitely check that out, and I'll leave a link in the description. So for some initial context, all of the models that they use in this paper are zero-shot models, so they are not prompted with initial information that can help them essentially generate a more accurate prediction or text on whatever cure you happen to be doing. Also, if you want a video on prompt engineering, let me know in the comments, because that's something that I've been meaning to cover. It's actually something that's come up in my research recently, so happy to talk about that. 
And the other important point is that the interactions between the models are scripted. So there is a third party, in this sense, user, who is coming in to help guide the models towards unearthing these ideas, these findings within the data sets they're looking at. So starting with a figure that I think is super interesting, we're going to walk through kind of three parts of this. But starting at the top with the images and their captions, the essential idea here is that we are looking to have the Socratic model generate a caption of the image for each image that is based on both what the visual language model sees as well as what the large language model infers about what might be happening in this image based on the visual description. Importantly, we're not getting any audio input here. That comes a little bit later in the paper, but in this case, the visual language model is predicting anything that is in light green text. The large language model is predicting anything that is in the light blue text, and then anything that is in gray is a user defined or user input. So as you can see, if we're looking at this first image on the top left, the user prompts the model, the Socratic model, to tell us what places are in this photo. And so our visual language model says that this is a clean room, which, yeah, this looks pretty clean. It also prompts for objects, or the user also prompts for objects, and so we can see that we're looking at some sort of shorts or jeans or a shirt, something that someone seems to be putting on, which is essentially what our large language model is able to infer from the places and the objects in this image. And from that, the visual language model is able to infer that this is someone getting dressed. That is the activity that is happening in this image. And so from there, our Socratic model can essentially summarize all of that information together and say, I am getting dressed. In comparison, the control model that we're looking at here is called ClipCap, and it essentially uses a model called Clip that runs on GPT-3 to caption images based on what is in them. One thing that I will note here is that the examples that I'm going to focus on in this video are egocentric, which is to say that they are from a first-person perspective, and so I think that that definitely has an influence on the caption that we tend to get, because if we're looking at this image on the top left from a first-person perspective, I am getting dressed makes sense. But in all likelihood, ClipCap has not been trained on a first-person perspective, or at least has not been so substantially trained on that perspective that it would be more likely to predict it. And so because of that, the captions that we get from our control model are just less likely to be accurate in general because the accurate answer based on the framework that we're working in is a first-person answer. And that provides additional context that our control model just doesn't have. So as you can see, if we look at the rest of the images in general, our Socratic model caption is more accurate than the control caption. But this isn't actually the end goal of this model. So from all of this, from the places and the objects and the description of what exactly is happening in this image, we're able to create context, essentially, for our Socratic model. And what this means is that it gives the model contextual information about what is happening in a particular scene at a particular point in time. So if we're looking at a first-person video, imagine having a GoPro strapped to your chest and then having it fed directly real-time into a model. Our model can generate what they call in this paper a language-based world state history from egocentric video, which essentially means contextual information for every point in the video from a first-person perspective, and ask questions that require temporal reasoning, which we'll also get into in the next section. So with all of this information, we can ask open-ended questions that require information that might not be immediately obvious from the data that we're looking at. So for example, we might have, how long did I watch TV today? That's a temporal reasoning question that requires us to have these timestamps see the progression of activities throughout the day. And so the answer from our large language model, which is informed by the information that we get from the visual language model, and if we had audio, the audio language model, is that we watched TV for about five hours today. And the explanation for that is that we were watching Netflix on TV for about three hours, and then we're watching a woman drink wine in a living room for about two hours. And so you can base that answer on the information that we get from the video. We can also ask questions like, what was I doing outdoors? Where the answer is, I was chopping wood in a yard. And the explanation is that I need wood to keep my fireplace going. And so figure five offers a really interesting 
explanation into the kind of discussion question and answer aspect of Socratic models. So as you can see, we initially start with the user asking when we last saw a remote control. This prompts the Socratic model to ask the language model to figure out what are we looking for? What are we searching for? That is the remote control based on the question. Our visual language model then finds matches for the remote control and timestamps them. The Socratic model asks the visual language model where are we? Which from the last timestamp, the visual language model figures out we're in the living room. So that might be one of the places that we saw the remote, as well as what else is in this room. So that would be the remote control, the television, and Netflix. From there, the Socratic model prompts both the language model and the visual language model. What was I doing at that time? And so that allows us to take both information from the visual language model, which summarizes this as watching Netflix, and the large language model, which summarizes this as watching Netflix and sitting on the couch, and combine that into a summary that says, I am watching Netflix on the television. This also allows us to create our world state history or the context that surrounds this question. So when the user asks, where did I leave my remote control? We can say, you left it in the living room, and the explanation behind that is that you were watching TV in the living room and you needed it to change the channel, which is based on all of this information that we found out earlier. They also get into incorporating audio into a Socratic language model. So if you were asking your model, when was the last time you heard the timer in your kitchen go off, that audio would provide additional information that would allow you to pinpoint a timestamp in both the audio and then in the video associated with this so you could figure out what else was happening at the time? Was the dog barking? Was there something else in the kitchen that you had a question about? And just provide additional information that when you then prompt the language model to answer a question, the language model would not otherwise have. Now, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this paper was that they did look at subjective reasoning or questions that are subjective to the user that require information that the model just probably doesn't have access to. So for example, Questions like, was I happy today, are almost impossible to answer without information that is outside of the data sets that the visual language model, the audio language model, and the large language model would have access to. And in the paper, they do note that these questions rely on biases within the language model's data sets, which can have negative consequences and should be managed carefully with additional mechanisms for safety and groundedness. So hopefully the model has enough prior information on the user's behavior to be able to kind of infer this, but at the end of the day, it's something that should probably be guarded against in any public deployment of a system like this. In terms of limitations, they do highlight a few. The main one that they talk about within the paper is the ability to accurately create the event log, which is both kind of a hardware and a software issue. So if you can't create accurate context, then the Socratic model can't make accurate responses to reasoning-based questions. That's just how that works. Part of this means that all the models that you use need to be trained on a broad enough data set that gets into the unsupervised Socratic model selection approach. But the other issue is that you need to make sure that your video and audio quality are good enough for the model to be able to accurately perform inference on it in the first place. In terms of what I think, I think that this is pretty cool. I think that this is one of the cooler large language model papers that I've seen, especially as someone who isn't necessarily interested in papers that continue to scale these massive models to be even bigger in order to perform 0.01% better on state-of-the-art results. I would love to see more work on developing modular ML systems that contain multiple models with different domain expertise that have some common language model that allows discussion. I also think it would be really interesting to use this approach to essentially probe model bias in a way that humans can understand, and that in particular the general public might be able to understand when engaging with these types of models. So by essentially forcing models to either reconcile domain shift differences or identify factors that led to a particular decision in a way that is easy for people to understand. I think the major caveat that comes with that is that you need to make sure that whatever the model is saying is actually accurate and that you're not missing something or 
otherwise hiding biases that we might not be able to see or that the model might not be able to put into words. So if you're interested in developing your own language models but don't know where to start on your machine learning journey, I would highly recommend checking out Brilliant who are kindly sponsoring today's video. If you've heard me talk about Brilliant before, then you know that it is a fun interactive tool for learning STEM based off the principle of active problem solving. Brilliant has an ever-growing catalog of courses in math, science, and computer science that help you learn concepts by working through them yourself in visually stimulating and hands-on ways, including courses on computer science fundamentals, algorithms, and neural networks. I recently took their course on neural networks as a bit of a refresher, and I highly recommend checking it out. Or if you ever wanted to learn how computer programming works but were put off by opaque coding language, Brilliant can help you learn to program without having to dig through the weeds of coding syntax in these fun interactive challenges. To get started for free, go to brilliant.org slash Jordan or click on the link in the description and the first 200 people to visit that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Otherwise, if you want to check out my other videos on language models, I'll leave a playlist up here. You can follow me on all my various socials down here and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.